Contested Bones, Part 10. We've been talking about the book Contested Bones by uh, Christopher Roop and John Sanford, published this last year. Um, and uh, it's available on the internet, including that, and that gives uh, contestedbones.org gives a, uh, uh, a quick summary of uh, the uh, reason for it being uh, created. The cover looks like that. I have a copy. Um, I have a few more copies coming in case somebody missed it last time. Uh, and uh, hopefully um, you guys will enjoy it enough that you want to get more copies for other people. This is um, Christopher Roop on the left and uh, John Sanford on the right. Um, the book starts with a prologue which explains that John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized that uh, evolution couldn't do everything it needed to do and furthermore that while it was supposed to be doing something there was genetic entropy or some people would call it devolution uh, constantly dragging things back and realized it didn't work and not only did it not work but that uh, species couldn't last as long as they're supposed to have. The he couldn't buy the uh, uh, even the uh, historical story, let alone the biological one. And then he started having cognitive dissonance with all the fossil evidence from man evolving from apes, and so he uh, and Chris Roop, um, is one of his protégés, started out to investigate, and they did a book, and what you see is what you get. Um, Chapter one discover, discusses the advancing apes icon uh, and then sets some boundaries um, about the general philosophy of science, the evolutionary story itself, scientific method, and taxonomic principles. And they explain that they are lumpers. Chapter two has the textbook picture which uh, follows Darwin's expectation, which is of course that famous ape to man uh, thing which is acknowledged to have been based on fragmentary evidence and in fact doesn't really fit everything. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like, things growing in all directions and some uh, evolutionists state that the ascent of man cannot be traced. Almost every fossil has been contested as to where its place is in the ape to man evolution story. Then he gets down to details. Neanderthals, in fact, are human. Homo erectus is, in fact, human. Degenerate human, but human. Uh, Homo uh, floresiensis, the hobbit, is human. Um, chapter 6, Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, is an ape. Ardipithecus rambidus is also an ape. Homo habilis is a mixture of ape and human or if you want to do, call it that, you can call it a false taxon. It doesn't really exist. There are homo bones and there are australopithecus bones and they're really not from the same creature. And australopithecus sediba is a mixture of human and ape as well, a false taxon. So now we get to Homo naledi, chapter 10. He raises the question, is it almost human or is it fully human? I guess some of that depends on how you define human. We may come back to that. The quote he has at the beginning of the chapter is, White is not alone in his uneasiness over Homo naledi. Reviewers at top scientific journals also found evidence for the new hominin species to be suspect, that is, Homo naledi. Berger and his team originally submitted multiple papers on Homo naledi to the prestigious journal, journal Nature, which rejected them. Oh! And that's uh, from a University of California at Berkeley article. Can you say why? 
Um, well, if you go to the article, I'm sure you can find out why. But uh, by the time we get done, you'll probably have a pretty fair idea of how, uh, of why some people kind of disagreed with the, uh, with the story that was being portrayed by Berger and company. Um, background in discovery of Naledi. In 2013, two cave explorers climbed 90 feet underground into the rising star cave system near the cradle of humankind, World Heritage Site of Gauteng Province in South Africa. In a nearly inaccessible region of the cave, known as the Dinaledi Chamber, the cavers stumbled upon a collection of human bones. They contacted paleo expert Lee Berger, who had discovered Sediba just five years earlier. Shortly after, Berger called National Geographic and began to celebrate. The disappointments associated with Sediba, whom you may remember Berger discovered, were quickly forgotten. A childhood dream of Berger was to someday find a hominin ancestor such as Lucy. His hopes had been high with the discovery of Sediba. However, the paleoanthropological community had largely rejected his findings for a number of reasons, and we went over those reasons last week. Berger's hopes must have been rekindled with the bones in the rising star cave that might possibly represent the bridge species linking ape to man. What did the cave explorers find and how did Berger and his team interpret the bones? Description of the fossils and evolutionary claims. The Dinaledi chamber yielded a total of 1,550 bones or bone fragments belonging to 15 very incomplete individuals. I'm going to say that figure one is probably, he should have said figure two here, but we'll see both of them very shortly. The finding was described as the richest assemblage of associated fossil hominins ever discovered in Africa. The remains were found scattered throughout the Dinaledi chamber with only a few of the bones in articulation, or that is physically connected to other bones. So most of them are like this all over. <coughs> Apparently hand was. There's figure one. That's the National Geographic cover. Almost human. None of the individuals were complete skeletons, so a single composite skeleton was assembled from the available remains from different individuals. And here we do have figure two meant. The recovered bones included broken upper and lower limbs, some vertebrae, some partial ribs, and almost complete hand and foot, pieces of the hip and upper jaw, one complete lower jaw, and skull fragments from four individuals. The bones were unmineralized. They were still bones. They were well preserved and were easily exposed. They were buried in no more than about 80 inches deep in a fine clay sediment. And there's a picture of 1,500 bones. And you can see that they assembled a skeleton. Now, is that skeleton um, all one? We don't know. In fact, it's reasonable to suppose that since there are apparently 15 duplicate parts in some cases, that so there were 15 different specimen, uh, 15 different people that contributed to the specimen. Um, it's highly likely that at least some of those bones are from different individuals, but they're all pretty close to each other. In fact, many bones were found lying exposed on the surface of the cave floor. Some were freshly broken. It's interesting to ask uh, how much sediment go gets in there per year, per thousand years, per million years, whatever. Um, suggesting they had been tampered with. No skeletons of other animals were found with the exception of a trapped bird and a few rodent skeletons. And more recently, a single baboon tooth. And I read from somewhere else that there's actually a couple of other uh, bones that got in there, but not very many. The remains appear to belong to a single hominin population representing all ages from infants to adults, with the latter being about five feet tall. Just for what it's worth, uh, that table is four feet wide. 120 centimeters. Uh, no, 220 centimeters, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> in 
It appeared as though the bodies were deliberately deposited in the cave chamber. And interestingly, that's a red comma. I have no idea why it's there. It's in the book as well. I mean, the printed book. Uh, but anyway, this possibility and its implications are discussed later. Researchers observed that certain distinct anatomical features were repeatedly observed among the samples. This suggested that there was only one species represented. For instance, similarities include short stature and body proportions, similar skulls, similar teeth, and other distinctive features found in multiple specimens. Very little morphological variation was observed between the 15 individuals apart from the age and size. Berger and colleagues made note of this in their paper published in the journal eLife. So this is all, I guess, nature wouldn't take it. They described the fossils as a morphologically hom homogeneous sample and described, assigned them remains to a new species, Homo naledi, which we're going to call naledi from here on out. The collection is a morphologically homogeneous sample that can be attributed to no previously known hominin species. Here we get, describe the new species, Homo naledi. So Berger has a, a, another species named after him, or named by him. Naledi in the South African Sotho language translates as star. It was named after the rising star cave where the remains were found. The re researchers felt that assigning the bones to Homo was appropriate considering its overall anatomy was very human, with the exception of a few features, hence National Geographic's headline, Almost Human. And this is where I think figure one really belonged. According to Berger, Naledi exhibited an unusual combination of traits in most respects Naledi is unquestionably human, but in some respects seem more primitive and apish, and in a few instances seem to show traits never seen before. In the eLife publication, Berger and colleagues described Naledi as an anatomical mosaic. We've been hearing a lot about that, haven't we? This anatomical mosaic is reflected in different regions of the skeleton. The morphology of the cranium, mandible, and dentition is mostly consistent with the genus Homo. But the brain size of Homo naledi is within the range of Australopithecus. Take that with a grain of salt. We're going to have fun with it. The lower limb is largely Homo-like, and the foot and ankle are particularly human in their configuration. But the pelvis appears to be flared markedly, like that of Australopithecus afarensis. We're going to have fun with that, too. The wrist, fingertips, and proportions are shared mainly with Homo, but the proximal and intermediate manual phalanges are markedly curved, even to a greater degree than in any Australopithecus. The shoulders are configured largely like those of the Australopiths. The vertebra, vertebra are most, most similar to Pleistocene members of the genus Homo, whereas the rib cage is wide distally, like Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy. This is very similar to how Berger describes Sidibe a mosaic of primitive and derived, derived traits. Primitive refers to ape-like and derived refers to anatomically human traits. Naledi does not appear to be an accidental mixture of human and non-human bones, unlike Sidiba and Hebelis. All of the bones recovered from the Dinaledi chamber appear to belong to a single population. In this chapter, we will argue that Naledi from this particular cave chamber of bones is fully human and not significantly different from Erectus and that both should be folded into Homo sapiens as the lump, as lumper paleo experts have insisted. Remember, these are, lumpers are not creationists necessarily. In fact, most of them are evolutionists. They just think they're not that much different. Did Naledi have ape-like bones? Well, the claim that Naledi was a precursor species of the other homo types, Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, etc., et ultimately, ultimately rests on those few bones that were viewed as less than fully human. So which bones did Berger and colleagues describe as anatomically human and which were said to be more like Australopithecus? Berger and colleagues in the journal eLife offer their interpretation. <coughs> homo Naledi presents yet a different combination of traits compared with Sediba. This species combines a human-like body size and stature with an australopith-sized brain. Features of the shoulder and hand apparently well suited for climbing and with human-like hand and wrist adaptations for manipulation. Australopith-like hip mechanics with human terrestrial ground adaptations of the foot and lower limb. Small dentition 
with primitive dental proportions. Well, something that's kind of halfway in between, but mosaic. The australopith-like features of the postcranium, that's everything but the skull, including the ribcage, shoulder, proximal femur, and relatively long curved fingers, also departs sharply from the morphology present in uh, MP humans and Homo sapiens. The similarities of Homo naledi to earlier members of Homo, including Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus, suggest that this species may be rooted within the original origin and diversification of our genus. All parties, uh, coming back to uh, Roop and Sanford, all parties agree that most of the Naledi bones are unambiguously human. So it is almost human at least. The clearly human bones of Naledi include the vertebrae, the hands, the wrists, the feet, the upper and lower limbs, excluding the shoulder, the limb proportions, the body size, and the shape of the skull, jaw, and teeth. However, Berger's list of Naledi's less than human bones is shorter. Small brain? We're going to go over these. Small sh smaller shoulders, l slight curvature of the fingers, details of hip me mechanics, exact dental proportions, and widening of the lower rib cage. It is because of these alleged ape-like features that the discovery team argues that Laledi was at the root of the genus Homo. As Berger told National Geographic, the message we're getting is of an animal right on the cusp of the transition from Australopithecus to Homo. Sounds like they're describing something that's over the cusp, but whatever. Not surprisingly, this interpretation is consistent with Berger's lifelong dream of finding a crucial missing link, and so his view is potentially colored by personal bias, as are everybody's. Even before Naledi was assigned an age, Berger had already proclaimed his finding to the world as the root ancestor to the genus Homo, just as he had claimed about Sediba. In the light of, the new, of new developments, Berger's claims regarding the significance of Naledi now appear to have been premature. And it's important to remember this when we get there. This was a bridge species, except the dates are wrong. Naledi's morphological differences from many humans are real. However, these differences are relatively minor and their significance seems to have been exaggerated. These Australopith-like characteristics are not inconsistent with the bones of modern human beings. Naledi bones, like those of Erectus, have some features that are atypical, but still overlap with modern human variation. Naledi's human skull, skull and brain case. The primary basis for declaring Naledi to be almost human is its small cranial capacity, but no complete skull was actually recovered. Four partial skull fragments were recovered and digitally pieced together into two composite skulls via a CT scanner. Well, kind of. Because they used skulls of different sizes, ages, and life likely different genders to make the composite, and because large fractions of the skull were missing, the digital reconstruction is of limited value. Obviously, if three or four skull fragments were from juveniles or small children, the estimated brain volume would be extremely misleading. The researchers point out, in order to obtain a volume calculation, the model has to be a closed surface, meaning that all the holes in the surface model had to be filled. When they say filled the holes, they mean they fill, only filled the holes in a virtual or conceptual sense. So they kind of, well, it probably comes around this way. Now, were they playing it straight down the middle? Well, we're going to find out. Not exactly. Though there is quite a bit of guesswork and possible bias in the reconstruction process due to these uncertainties, the adult cranial capacity of Naledi was estimated to range between 466 cubic centimeters and 560 cubic centimeters. Keep those numbers in mind, we're going to come back to them. The larger skulls were assumed to belong to males and the smaller skulls to females. With a, well, that's probably true, with a brain size less than half of the average modern human, which is around 1350 cubic centimeters, the researchers regarded this as being strong evidence that Naledi was not fully human. And uh, there's a Naledi skull, and it has, interestingly, it has a forehead that actually goes up somewhat. Um, 
So it doesn't have the, the absent forehead that some, you know, Homo erectus, and particularly the hobbit, does. Nevertheless, the Leti seem to have a disproportionately small skull and brain case. Modern people with microcephaly have reductions in brain volume that are very similar to what is seen in the Leti. If you see green dots, that means that I omitted some material. I uh, am coming to an increasing admiration of the people from Reader's Digest. Uh, <coughs> Significantly, Homo erectus and Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit, sh also share this characteristic even though they are fully human. Indeed, the hobbit had an even smaller brain case uh, size than the Leti, 426 cubic centimeters, um, which of course came out after the Leti, interestingly. And we're going to find out it's quite a bit smaller. Using the same logic, one might assume that the hobbit could not possibly be a modern human. But a number of leading, leading paleo experts regard hobbit as being fully human, though suffering from pathology. We went over this in chapter 5. We have argued that these extinct people groups were suffering from genetic isolation, inbreeding, and subsequent genetic degeneration, as experts in the field have also suggested. Endocast scans of the interior of a skull's brain case that reflects the out, outer surface of the brain, can be used to understand the structure of the brain. Dean Falk found that the hobbit's brain was remarkably similar to a modern human brain, fully equipped with Brodmann's Area 10, a region of the brain not found in apes and associated with higher cognition, typical of modern humans. Endocast scans of the interior surface of the Naledi brain case were published in the eLife journal. Like the hobbit, Naledi appears to have had a fully human brain, as New Scientist states. Dean Falk at uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee is especially excited by the fact that the Burgers team has produced a cast of Homo Leti's small brain. Images of it, remember it's not a complete cast. Some parts had to be interpolated, but apparently some parts were able to be found. Images of it hint the, of in, at interesting features close to one brain region associated with speech in modern humans, she says. Uh, we broke his area, of course. Burgess says it's uh, possible for the first time we found another creature not that closely related to us, well, yet with a cognitive ability different but essentially equal to ours. Regardless of what we call these different early variants of man, all the members of the genus Homo share a unique part of the brain called Broca's speech area, which is absent in apes. Broca's speech area is seen in all three of the smaller brain people groups, Naledi, Erectus, and Hobbit. The presence of Broca's speech area in Naledi further indicates that Naledi was fully human. Only true humans have speech and can share concepts through language. Uh, that's one way of defining people. Only human speech, language, and cognition can explain why the Naledi bones were deliberately deposited in the Naledi chamber, suggesting belief in an afterlife. The only way Naledi could have carried their dead deep into the rising star cave, we're going to come back to that, was if they had fire. All of these types of behavior are unique to humans. Naledi, like Erectus and Hobbit, must have had abstract reasoning, language, art, fire, and a belief in an afterlife. In other words, they must have been fully human. Why did Naledi, Erectus, and Hobbit all have abnormally small brain cases and other genetic abnormalities? And why do these small uh, and anomalous populations disappear? A very strong case can be made that they suffered from inbreeding, which led to their morphological oddities and eventual extinction. All hunter-gathering people live in small tribes, typically of fewer than 100 people. If such tribes are isolated and do not interbreed with other tribes over time, they must always undergo genetic in inbreeding. In such cases, genetic drift will cause many bad mutations to arise, and they will escape removal by natural selection. These accumulating bad mutations will then drift through the tribe to the point where everyone carries the same bad mutations. We know the result of inbreeding is that the group will eventually develop distinctive and anomalous morphologies, reduced fertility, and reduced intelligence. Reduced intelligence will sometimes be coupled with reduced brain size. In addition, if a tribe starts from just a few individuals, which is how many new tribes start, and remains isolated, there will be a very strong genetic founder effect, such as uh, 
such that every such tribe would tend to have its own unique appearance. Given a small and isolated hunter-gathering tribe, not only might there be degenerative e inbreeding, there might be simultaneously a limited amount of natural selection for a smaller brain volume. This applies not only to Naledi, but also to Erectus, Hobbit, and any other small population where insufficient food is a persistent problem. Given starvation conditions, mutations that require, re, reduce required caloric intake would be strongly favored, even at the cost of some otherwise important functions. Brain costs a lot, you got less brain, you can survive better in starvation conditions. This type of trade-off is called reductive evolution, short-term gain at the cost of long-term genetic generation. The human brain burns calories much more quickly than other, any other organ, and so under starvation conditions, people with small brains will survive while other, all others will die. Energetically, the brain is a very costly organ, consuming as much as 20% of the body's total energy need at rest. In the yearbook of physical anthropology, evolutionary scientists believe there would be a strong, strong selection for a smaller brain size in small populations with limited resources. As has been widely noted, this is a quote, of course, the brain is an extremely costly organ from a nutritional perspective, consuming about 16 times as much energy as does muscle by weight. Thus, sustaining trends in brain size um, increase requires additional en energetic resources and a clear selective advantage for the organism involved. Uh, boy, that's a interesting phrase. Uh, sentence. I'm going to skip over a bunch more stuff, which basically says the same kind of thing. Finally, the shape, not size, of the Naledi skull is further evidence that it is fully human. Its shape appears even more modern than the skulls of most Homo erectus. And that should have an italic on erectus. Rather than a low sloping or absent forehead, Naledi had a higher vaulted dome and a rounded skull similar to those of modern humans. In addition, the skull had less pronounced chewing uh, muscle attachments, a more human-shaped jaw, small teeth, and a flatter face. It actually looked more human than Homo erectus. And if we've gone through this before and Homo erectus is human, then there's really not that much uh, more reason to argue that Naledi was not human. Although, see, if it started out with a small brain, and then you have bigger brain Homo erectus, and then you have bigger brain um, Homo sapiens, Yes, we're moving in the right direction. Berger and, her, and colleagues affirm, that this is, affirm this in their eLife report. The morphology of the cranium, mandible, and dentition is mostly consistent with the genus Homo, but the brain size of Naledi is within the range of Australopithecus. It was primarily on the basis of small brain size that Naledi was demoted to less than human. Yet, as discussed above, neural organization is a better indicator of intelligence and humanness than is brain size. Brain size is not what defines humanness. As Willerman and researchers note in the journal Intelligence, there is no strong direct relationship between brain size and intelligence among modern humans. Which is a little striking to think about. Naledi's human feet. The clearest anatomical distinction that separates all apes from humans is the structure of the foot. The human foot is truly unique. The most obvious difference is seen in the grasping nature of the feet of non-human primates. This involves not just the size and angle of the great toe, but the form and function of the bottom of the foot. In all humans, the big toe falls in line with the other four toes. This is markedly different from primates, all of which have an opposable thumb-like great toe that juts out to the side and is called the hallux. For instance, a paleo expert from Duke University compared the lady's foot to that of a modern Kenyan bushman and commented, if you found the foot by itself, you'd think some bushman had died. Dan Lieberman, paleoanthropologist of Harvard University, agrees, stating, the foot is indeed strikingly human and suggests it walked and possibly ran much like modern humans. Skipping over a few more paragraphs, which basically say the same thing, and looking at the picture, and you can see that here is the, everything seems to be lining up and the toe is straight, not curved around or anything like that. I, you can argue that, well, maybe they put it straight, but then it seems to be articulated with the next uh, foot. By the way, uh, for those of you who are observant, you will notice that the modern foot has a fracture. I don't know why they picked that one. 
to show you. Um, normally this bone is connected all the way down to there. And if you look at it very closely, you think maybe there's some uh, extra bone there, so it's probably an old fracture. But anyway, just for fun. Now that is human hands. The human hand is also very distinctive, which reliably distinguishes man from apes. In a study published in the journal Nature, uh, researchers acknowledged the hand is one of the most distinctive traits of humankind. The human hand can be distinguished from that of apes by its long thumb relative to the fingers. In a separate Nature paper describing the hand of Naledi, Kivel and coll uh, collaborators affirm this. And I'm going to skip their con confirmation. And there's a bunch of stuff. And it's all interesting. And the truth of the matter is I'm skipping over a lot of stuff that, that I would love to be able to to bring to you, but there's no way with the time frame. There's a picture of the Naledi hand. You'll notice that we're missing the top of the fifth metacarpal. Um, and you can see the modern human hand is pretty close. What I want to draw your attention to is here's a chimpanzee hand to go with it from uh, the previous chapter. You can see the chimpanzee has long fingers and relatively short thumb. The thumb doesn't even come up to the second metacarpal. Whereas in a human hand, it's quite long. And in the Laletti hand, it's quite long. And another shot of this from the original paper has that, that uh, thing even longer. So I suspect that it's, uh, 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 it's not as, uh, it isn't as, as uh, short as what it's showing here. Uh, interestingly, you can see the tufts on the end of this. You don't really see the tuft on the end of the thumb. But that's uh, so that thumb may have gotten its uh, tough broken off as well. The researchers acknowledge the wrist, palm, and fingers sh share an overall morphology with that of modern humans. Shreve and National Geographic notes this as well. The thumb, wrist, and palm bones all look remarkably modern. This leads to the question, if the general anatomy of the hand is admittedly human, then what exactly made the researchers claim Naledi possessed a combination of primitive and derived features not seen in the hand of any other hominin. What features were supposedly more ape-like and primitive? In the discovery paper, Berger and re researchers provide the answer. The wrist, fingertips, and proportions of the fingers are shared mainly with Homo, but the proximal and intermediate manual phalanges are markedly curved even to a greater degree than in any Australopithecus. This is interesting. The finger bones of Naledi are said to be curved more than the tree climbing Australopithecines. Let's go back there and look at the, you know, unfortunately they don't show it in the lateral view, so you can't really see how much curvature you've got. But you, just eyeballing it, it doesn't look like there's that much different curvature between the chimpanzee and the human uh, in, the, in the front view. Whatever. They may be straining a little bit there. In fact, the idea that slight finger curvature is retained from a more ape-like ancestor is not logical, because in that case, the Australopithecines should have more finger curvature than the Leti, but have less. More importantly, finger curvature and many other bone alterations can be explained solely through physiological um, adaptation. A physical alteration to the bone caused by continuous use, not by genetics, having nothing to do with evolution. It is widely understood that bones change their shape and density based on their use and phys the physical stresses they experience. For example, weightlifters develop thicker and denser bones. Even in baby apes, finger curvature does not occur until they engage in suspensory and limb grasping locomotory behavior. Studies by evolutionary paleoanthropologists uh, Pasiuli and Richmond have shown, as noted in the human lineage, that phalangeal curvature reflects use, not genetic predisposition. Ironically, a separate National Geographic article offers this exact explanation for Naledi's curved fingers. We might think, tend to think of a skeleton as basically a steel superstructure uh, our muscles are draped over, but our bones are living, growing, and changing based on use just as much as the rest of us. For climbers of all sorts, the suspension of weight and the repeated strong gripping applies stresses that induce the digits of the fingers to curve. 
This is visible in x-rays of athletes and is visible in the bones of Naledi's fingers as they rest in your hand. So maybe they just held a lot of spears or something. If finger curvature can be accentuated in modern humans due to habitual mechanical stresses applied during gripping forces, then on what grounds can it be considered an evolutionary trait retained from an ape-like ancestor? Curved fingers could arise by habitual tree climbing or rock climbing or habitual tool use. The slightly curved fingers of Naledi are not credible evidence that was less than human transitional form. Uh, Naledi's human shoulders and ribs. In the Naledi discovery paper, Berger and colleagues described the shoulder of Naledi as being configured largely like those of Australopiths, a shoulder anatomy allegedly retained from an ape-like ancestor. The Naledi research team explains the shoulder of Homo Naledi is configured with the scapula situated high and lateral on the thorax, short clavicles, and little or no torsion of the humerus. Uh, Let's consider each of these traits of Naledi individually to see if they are also found in anatomically modern humans. If they are, then these features cannot be cited as evidence that Naledi is less than human. We suggest that Berger and collaborators may have underestimated the possible extent of variation in the human form. High placed shoulder with funnel uh, shaped rib cage. You may remember that uh, Neanderthal had that. Berger and colleagues claim this feature is characteristic of Australopithecines and thus suggest Naledi is a bridge species, but a high and more laterally positioned shoulder blade is not exclusive to Australopiths and living apes, but can be found in anatomically modern humans. This trait correlates with the shape of the upper rib cage. So for humans with a narrow upper rib cage, the scapula would naturally rest higher on the thorax. Researchers reporting in the Journal of Human Evolution in 2015 found this to be the case with Turcaniboy, Homo erectus. Clavicle shape and curvature in Homo erectus are also consistent with the modern human-like form. The single exception to this is Turcaniboy, his increased superior clavicle curvature, which could result in a slightly more superiorly placed acromial facet and a scapula that sits higher on the thorax. So here's Homo erectus with one. The Flores Hobbit, a dwarfed Homo sapiens, see chapter 5, also appears to have had a slightly higher scapula, positioned more toward the side. This feature is known to occur in modern humans suffering from Laurent syndrome, a congenital deficiency of insulin-like growth factor 1, and the same disease some experts believed afflicted Hobbit. And of course, we mentioned Neanderthals. The short clavicle. Beside, despite the claims of Berger and colleagues, a shorter clavicle cannot be used as evidence that Naledi is a new species. Shorter clavicles are simply a uh, consequence of rib cage or thorax shape, unfound in humans. In other words, they're all, they're all goes together. For instance, erectus, that is Trichanoboy, has is which is the most complete erectus we have, by the way, has the has a shoulder clavicle because of the narrow shorter clavicle because of the narrow upper rib cage. The modern human dubbed Hobbit also displayed this feature. Uh, Herskovitz et al. insists Hobbit was a small-bodied modern human subject to a type of dwarfism known as Laron syndrome. This definitely has some kind of dwarfism. Humeral torsion angle, Larson et al. define this feature carefully as follows. Humeral torsion refers to the orientation of the head relative to the distal end of the humerus. Modern humans display a high degree of torsion. Only African apes and modern humans display, display a high degree of humeral torsion, which means if we had it, it, it could be an ape, in fact. In apes, this anatomical feature is well suited for walking on all fours, a quadrupedal lo locomotion. Gibbons have a low degree of torsion and orang orangutans have a moderate degree. The Australopiths also fall in this range. Little or no humeral torsion is regarded by Berger et al. as one of Naledi's unique traits not found in modern humans. And there's the quote. Um, this was used, and there's a mutation that uh, escaped my uh, mutation correcting device. Uh, this was used to justify its assignment to a new species. However, low humeral torsion has been found in other humans, such as Erectus. 
And for their support, paleoanthropologist John Hawkes noted there's a huge range of torsion, including within normal populations now, extending as low as macaque values. Uh, macaque being a monkey. Furthermore, modern athletes have lower humeral torsion angles than most people. Roach et al. in the Journal of Anatomy state, several recent studies have found that throwing athletes typically have lower humeral torsion, retroversion, and a greater range of external rotation at the shoulder than non-athletes. It helps you to throw better if you constructed that way. The Lady's human hip. Berger et al. write in their published report that the pelvis appears to be flared markedly like that of Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy. Uh, in order to make this argument, one must at first assume that the reconstruction of Naledi's hip is accurate. Keep in mind, Naledi's broken hip bones are very fragmentary, and we're going to see those. Um, there are a lot of missing portions, though some features may still be discernible. But here's what it looks like. Wow. Make a complete reconstruction. The South African erectus hypothesis. A number of researchers, including the respected paleoanthropologist uh, Chris Stringer and Tim White, have noted that many similarities between have noted the many similarities between Naledi and Erectus. Stringer notes, overall to my eye, the material looks most similar to the small bodied examples of Homo erectus from Massini in Georgia, which is by the way where they found apparent interbreeding of Homo erectus, Homo denisova, and um, Homo neanderthalensis. Exhibit, uh, uh, pardon me, evidence for deliberate disposal of the dead. Perhaps the most powerful evidence that Naledi was fully human is the cultural evidence. The Naledi bones were deliberately deposited in the Din Naledi chamber. This required great ingenuity and strongly suggested a belief in an afterlife. One of the mysteries surrounding Naledi is how the bones ended up deep underground in a cave that is essentially inaccessible without modern climbing and caving equipment. Two cavers, Stephen Tucker and Rick Hunter, found the bones. Even these experienced climbers were dumbfounded in trying to explain how the bones got into the chamber. How do these quite large bones get into this, pl this place in the cave, a place where we as cavers with protective cl clothing, helmets and especially lights struggle to get to? How could these bones be deposited there? If Naledi was indeed a non-human animal, the deliberate deposit of these bones requires abstract reasoning, forethought, purpose, extreme commitment, fire, ropes, etc. Only humans use fire to light caves and only humans bury their dead. This problem has been the focus of many popular press articles and has certainly helped dramatize the discovery. The, uh, tried to get people to get down there and they had to ask for specially small cavers. Six small framed women who were able to squeeze their way into the cave's most narrow passages were added to the team to recover the bones. Remember, Naledi is small too. Figure 7 shows a simplified illustration of the cave system in cross-sectional view. To access the chamber, the six brave women had to perform a superman's crawl through a 15-foot long a five meter tunnel. The constriction is so narrow, less than 10 inches in diameter, wow, that the only way they could get through is by wriggling along on their belly and extending their arms above their head, despite being slim and flexible. And there's a Superman's crawl, and then, then they had to crawl over a bunch of rocks and then they had to find the chute, which we'll have a photo of in just a minute. From there, they had to climb up a rocky structure known as the Dragon's Back in order to locate the vertical chute that leads down 40 feet into the Dinaledi Chamber of Fossils. The chute is lined with jagged rocks hind hindering descent. Oh, I should go back one more thing. Um, the bones were not found all here. They were found down in here, which means that you couldn't just drop the bodies. The chute is lined with jagged rocks hindering descent. The narrowest point is only 7.5 inches wide. Figure eight. As Jamie Shreve writes in the Naledi cover story in National Geographic, 
before we get to it, I think we'll have a photo of that. Whoa. There's just not much room there. Try to imagine getting down there unless you had already figured out how to make rope or worse yet, try to figure out how you would get back up after you drop somebody down there, actually after you move somebody uh, down there. And it's pretty amazing to think about. Deliberate disposal of bodies would still have required hominins to find their way to the top of the chute through pitch back black darkness and know it was there. Um, and back again, which almost certainly would have required light torch or fires lit at intervals. The notion of such a small brain creature exhibiting such complex behavior seems so unlikely that many other researchers have simply refused to credit it. I don't believe it happened. Well, the problem is, of course, it did. It seems unlikely that Naledi tossed all of their dead down the chute into the chamber because the bones were found throughout the cave floor, another mutation that I failed to catch, and not just directly below the vertical chute where they would have landed if dropped from above. The presence of well-articulated skeletal parts far from the chute's opening suggests that Naledi actually entered the chamber. Berger himself acknowledges this behavior is exclusive to cognitively modern humans. Until the moment of discovery of Naledi, I would have probably said to you that it was our defining character. The idea of burial of the dead or ritualized body disposal is something utterly uniquely human. How old is Naledi? Oh, this is the fun part. What is unusual about this particular discovery is that the bones were not officially dated at the time of the publication or release to the media. They postulated that it was probably two million years old, which would be just about the right time. Media headlines regarding the identity of a putative new hominin species are always reported after a date is published, not beforehand, normally. Berger was already acclaiming a date of around two to three million years. Um, carbon dating was also considered for Naledi, which is of interest to me, but um, it could never provide an appropriate age for a candidate ancestor to the genus Homo because it cannot yield dates beyond 50,000 years old. That is, no measurable carbon-14 should remain after so many half-lives. Nevertheless, carbon-14 was surprisingly detected, suggesting an age of an lady of about 30,000 years old, which is about what the dinosaurs date, for what it's worth. Uh, however, the anomalously young age was promptly rejected by Dirks et al. on the basis of presumed contamination. Well, it has to be. Those things have to be older than 30,000 years old. Continuing on, a little later, a later interview with Berger in a news article posted by the University of the Waters Rand, which is where he works, um, discussed their early attempts to date the bones and surrounding deposits using a number of different techniques. Uh, ESR, carbon-14, uranium series uh, techniques and optically stimulated luminescence. They tried everything. It appears that the dating methods yielded ages that were simply unacceptable to the discovery team. And probably split as well. New data confirms Leti is not a transitional bridge species. As this book goes to press, fall 2017, so remember they're writing all this stuff and they're saying, well we don't know what date it is. And maybe it's younger than everybody thinks. And now they get this stuff. It appears that the date has finally been assigned to Naledi, but because the various dating methods did not agree, it took two years of trial and error <laughs> before multiple estimates were reported. In 2017, the Naledi fossils, fossils were dated as being 236 to 335,000 years old. Oops. This is a game changer. Naledi had to be around two to three million years old in order to serve as a transitional bridge species listening, uh, linking the Australopiths to the genus Homa. So it either has to be something that's been living for a long time or that's degenerated from humans. You can take your pick. Anyway, and there is the nature of our small-brained early human lived more recently than expected, N Homo Naledi, a few hundred thousand years ago. In the light of these young dates, the paleo community now acknowledges that Naledi is not our ancestor and is not the precursor to all later homo species. 
Berger himself now warns that primitive-looking traits don't necessarily mean a primitive evolutionary origin or age, and that such traits can be misleading. Well, I guess so. In other words, Naledi from the Din Naledi chamber is fully human, homo sapiens. Conclusion that Naledi was fully human. A careful analysis of the bones in question supports that Naledi was fully human. Naledi is not a new species, nor does it have features retained from a more ape-like ancestor. Naledi's distinctive features are better explained in terms of inbreeding and physiological changes. Physiologic change involves non-genetic, non-heritable modifications due to environment. That is, curved fingers can be caused by mechanical stress from either tool use or climbing. Take your pick. The discovery of Naledi bones made a huge media splash. A flood of popular press articles and news articles, um, news outlets, including the front page of the New York Times, showcased Naledi as conclusive proof of human evolution. Why oh, they must need it really bad. The front cover of National Geographic offered a catchy headline, almost human. Was the media hype consistent with the science? The paleo community was clearly more skeptical than the media, just as they largely rejected Berger's claims about Sediba. Leading experts in the field did not take Berger's Naledi claim seriously. A UC Berkeley article reports, White is not alone in his uneasiness over Homo Naledi. Researchers at top scientific journals, you may remember us reading that. Berger and his team originally sus submitted multiple papers on Homo Naledi to the prestigious journal Nature, which rejected them which is why it's in e-life instead of nature. Preeminent scientific authorities, including leading evolutionary paleo experts, have dismissed the claim made by Berger and colleagues regarding Naledi. The paleo community as a whole now rejects Naledi as a possible missing link. So why is the public being led to believe that the Naledi discovery is conclusive proof of human evolution? Well, actually, of course, it's going silent now. Uh, being an evolutionist means never having to say you're sorry. The failure of paleo experts to find a legitimate ape-like ancestor to man after over 150 years of fossil hunting is remarkable. This flies directly in the face of the claim that human evolution is an uncontested fact. It is clear that neither Habilis nor Sediba nor Noletti bridged the vast evolutionary gap between the ape-like Australopiths and man. So all of our bridge people have disappeared. Noletti is the latest and greatest claim of a bridge species between the Australopith and man. The date now assigned to Naledi shows it is not a pre-human species, but appears to be a degenerate human population that lived in isolation. The missing link is still missing. The failure of Naledi as a transitional bridge species might seem to be the final nail in the coffin of the ape-to-man paradigm. However, the origin of man is not just a scientific issue. There are deep moral and philosophical implications tied to this very important topic. Regardless of the evidence, the ape-to-man uh, paradigm is not likely to go away soon. And the author's note says new findings were reported in the eLife Journal just prior to the publication of this book. A new chamber in the Rising Star Cave System revealed additional fossil remains that have been assigned to Homo Naledi. We will refrain from making further comments on these newly discovered remains until we've carefully examined these findings. This is probably a wise idea. However, it is of interest that a complete skull was found with reportedly, this time complete not having to guess, that the brain was actually 610 cubic centimeters. Oops. So, yeah, it's small. But they underestimated it when they tried to make those reconstructions. One can ask why. The chapter, I think, this is my take, of course, makes a convincing argument that Australopithecus naledi is human. There seem to be some ape-like characteristics to some bones, most notably the brain, rib cage, fingers, and possibly the pelvis, but they can be found in humans as well. One can insist that the bones are not quite human, but I think that insistence can be not only shown to be ideologically motivated, but also demonstrated to have misled the investigators, especially with brain size, and with the dates that they came up with. Remember the Bush theory of human evolution? Bush theory of evolu human evolution is okay, but you need to have a main stem. You have to have a main stem, otherwise it doesn't work. Common descent requires, I mean, that's the definition of common descent, that some populations had continuous ancestor-descendant relationship all the way between apes and humans. That is, you have to have 
something that goes between point A and point B. Now, is it a nice straight line like the traditional picture? You know, with apes continuing on or perhaps moving in a slightly different direction. And remember, this is one dimensional and we're talking about uh, two, three, five, 20 dimensions, uh, multi-dimensional. Or could you have two different populations that are evolving and kind of may have some contact with each other with various parts that get stuck at one level or another, such as the different apes, kind of mostly apes, kind of mostly people? Um, or do you have something like Stephen Jay Gould has, where it suddenly kind of jumps from apes to people, and if you're unlucky, you don't find any intermediates? Well, there's one more picture, and it's the picture that this book advocates, and that is that you have basically humans going straight and apes going straight with various branches on various sides. You can put Neanderthals, oh, pardon me, before I get to that, if that's the picture, it is incompatible with evolution unless you have some kind of ape to human intermediate, perhaps fast as in a Gould um, but it has to get to the human before there's human. Otherwise, this whole scenario is reminiscent of a creative event. <coughs> Without that branch, this is incompatible with common descent, which means it's incompatible with evolution. Now, you can put Neanderthals up in the top or on the bottom. You can put Homo erectus on the top or on the bottom. Presumably, if Homo erectus really started there, then you really need a branch to come up and meet it. You can put the hobbit on the top or on the bottom. You can put uh, Australopithecus afarensis on the top or on the bottom. You can put uh, Ardipithecus rambidus on the top or on the bottom. If Homo habilis and Homo, uh, pardon me, and um, Australopithecus sediba are different bones that are artificially put together, then they really should be split between one and the other, either on the top or at the bottom. And finally, uh, Homo naledi, which we've just been talking about, basically belongs in the same general position as Homo floresiensis. Now, you really need something to be in the middle. Otherwise, you're looking at two different branches, uh, two different trees, and that does not exist in a, uh, in a scenario that requires common descent. You really need that branch that goes before somewhere. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Change what name? If they all agree that this is a human now, why is it still Australopithecus <sighs> instead of Homo? Because this, the splitters will uh, take small differences and say, well, it all fits together. Um, I'm not sure that it's totally defensible. Uh, it would be a little bit like you were to take uh, people who lived in uh, uh, Pitcairn Island and call them Homo pitcairnensis or something. But they're still calling them Australopithecus instead of Homo erectus. Well, no. Homo naledi is Homo. Oh, they changed the name then. Because it's you call them naledi. Australopithecus naledi. Australopithecus sediba. Did I, did I, if, I miss, if I misspoke, Naledi. it's Homo Naledi the whole, the whole way through. Everybody recognizes it belongs closer to Homo oh, okay, than yeah. to Australopithecus. Yeah. Either way, it's a rapid evolution. Yeah. Just, did they happen to uh, say what they dated? They got the 30,000 year date, the carbon 14 date. Was oh, they that? just ignore it. What's that? It, they just ignore it. It's contamination. So yeah, I know, but count. was it the bone? Was it the well, probably. carbonate around the it's cave? Probably a bone. Or? 
It's probably a bone. Yeah. But, um, <coughs> You know, I, I find it fascinating. You, you take, if the carbon-14 agrees with what you want, you take it. If it, uh, if it kind of sort of agrees, you put it in a footnote. And if it doesn't match, why, you just kind of don't mention it. Yeah, and, and that's published in the scientific literature. Yes. <laughs> Is there any reason why they're suggesting that the bodies were taken in there and the people who moved the bodies in then withdrew? It would seem to me they fled there and never got out. That would be a possibility. In that case, though, I would expect bodies to, to, there to be more bodies that were all together. Now, I understand that there was a hand that was pretty much all together, so they're pretty sure that that was actually one hand. Um, but in general, they're kind of, uh, it almost looks like they went in, they, they put bodies in or something like that, and then they maybe scattered it. Um, yeah, it's possible that some people fled from, uh, I don't know, fire, wolves, who knows what, um, got down and then never, never got back up. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of be surprised. Yeah, uh, well, boy, it, it seemed like it, once you get past the Superman's crawl, you should be pretty safe from whatever it was that was coming after you. So I'm not, uh, the fleeing is hard. Uh, what I really can't see is how you can wash stuff in. And they look for extra passages, you know, that you could get in another way, or all kinds of stuff, and we're not able to find any. Yeah, it's, uh, well, uh, you know, just the, the washing theory is just really, really hard to see. Mm -hmm. Um, although I suppose that if you were washing just single bones in there, but you'd like to you'd like to have more different kinds of bones. That's the thing that's weird, is that mm. you know there's maybe one or two other bones of other stuff. Mm. The rest of it is all human, and that suggests that somehow you got to concentrate the human bones first. Also yeah, uh, there's. There's no wood. Uh, yeah, there's not there. Well, like I say, there's there's a couple of rat bones and an owl bone, which could certainly get down there. But other than that, it's not it's not a mixture of all kinds of stuff. And we do have mixtures, like the Australopithecus sediba that we talked about last week is a mixture all over the place, and it has humans and bones and pigs and whatever. Well, there's Fontachevade cave in France, that was ended up being a wash-in because they found a hole in the roof. Um, but they found a lot of other stuff with those bones. Well, the, this one, the way you get into it is by the hole in the roof. And it doesn't right. look like doesn't there's have any hole passages. In, there's that no come hole in this roof, right? The rest of the way. You don't want to entirely ignore the possibility of earthquakes changing the configuration there a little bit. True. True. And that's one possibility is that, the, that, the, that what we see now is not what it used to be. Uh, in, uh, you still have to have mostly humans with, uh, without a lot of apes or pigs or donkeys or you know, other human associated animals that, uh, that uh, somehow got in there in a relatively pure form. But even and if it, it was a wash and it's irrelevant, I mean, there's still human bones. Yeah, there's still human bones and they're still all related human bones. I mean, at least, you know, in terms of what they look like. Now, the fun part of it is there's another part of the cave now that has the same kind of bones. Yeah, and, it, and if it's a full skeleton, a full skull anyway, they can check the inner ear and see that it's and see if up, they, upright they, gait. Upright. Yeah, that's right. Because all these other hominids that were supposed to be uh, more ape-like, they all had upright gates as well. They had the inner ears that finally, that's what the reason why Tim, Tim White was pretty skeptical about some of these things is because he's the first one to analyze the inner ear structure of the semicircular circular canals. Did, did he do that by CT? Just yeah, curious? by CT. Uh -huh. yeah. So it's an it's a endocast just like the brain endocast. And one of, one of these missing links, too, Tim White figured out it was a, a dolphin rib. So it wasn't a human or ape at all. So he, he's a pretty skeptical person. Yeah. Well, except for Ardipithecus ramidus, where he seems to be pretty unskeptical. 
Well, I, I haven't uh, looked looked at that one much, but generally speaking, I mean, he's an evolutionist, which is surprising to me because he seems to debunk a lot of stuff that <laughs> everybody else goes for. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Was already brought up. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, just a question. How was it found again? How, how, would these, how did they find the little chamber? Uh, well, some guys were just cr crawling around in a cave looking at stuff. And, yeah. Uh, I know. Um, they must have been small guys because, you know, I don't think if you're 6'4", you don't go through that. And how did they get the stuff out of it? How did they get the stuff out? Well, once they found it, that's why they recruited these small-bodied women to get in and out of it because, you know, they, you could... Well, I, actually, it probably would have been happy to have a midget do it, but... Low bags. Also, the brain size. They, they you have modern human examples of proportional dwarfism that have smaller brains than that, smaller brains than 400 cc's that still have modern human intelligence. I mean, they're fully intelligent human beings, and they're only like two and a half feet tall, and they still have brains that work just fine. Yeah, so. well, supposing that they, supposing that they were, you know, like 90 or 80 IQ, uh, you can function pretty well with that if you need to. And maybe not all of the people, I mean, I'm thinking of, you know. Well, like Tom was, Thumb, he's only, he's only a little yeah. over two feet tall, but he had a normal IQ, over 100. Yeah. And his brain was like as big as my hand, like that. And he had a normal IQ, so it's, you can't say anything about brain size and intelligence. And well, there's some people who have, they have a problem where they've wiped out most of their brains and there's just a thin rim of gray matter and the middle is all liquid. And they discovered yeah. on an incidental CT scan. Right, and that person was absolutely normal. I've, I've so, heard, of a, heard of a girl who was valedictorian of her class with, with a... With, with a, a thin a rim or of <laughs> cortex that's like just that. a... Kind of leads us to wonder I, I, I what could is see. All, all the rest of the brain being used for? I know. Well, you know, Especially that's an interesting mine. question. I mean, <laughs> We're always told that we only use 2% of our brain when it turns out that's literal. That's literal. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all how the brain is structured to, to produce intelligence uh, and abilities. So. Yeah, some people get by with less than others, but anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, the thing of it is, uh, now of course they've, they've done it in a careful series because, you know, in Neanderthals are human. Well, yeah, maybe so. I mean, they interbred with us. They have larger brains than us. Uh, people are kind of semi-comfortable with that, and it's probably fair. And it's also fair to say that when they were first shown, they were supposed to be brutes. And the truth of the matter is that that's a an ideologically based exaggeration. Yeah, but the Neanderthals are now, they've redrawn them and now they look like Jean-Luc Picard, you know. And, yeah. And, uh. and so, and the, the occipital bone had showed that if you have a little weight on the back of your head, they did these tests on, on athletes and you can run farther with an occipital bone. Because you don't have to because hold your head. Because your head doesn't bounce in all around. Yeah. You know, and so. Interesting. And in some ways, you know, you, maybe, maybe Abraham was Neanderthal. Well, the, the, yeah. the thing of it is that, you know, you start with Neanderthal, then if you go to Homo erectus, you say, yeah, probably human also. And in fact, there's some evidence for intermarriage there, or uh, inter, uh, inheritance anyway. And then you go to uh, the Hobbit, and then it was interesting they didn't go to Naledi first. I think that's because Naledi was the last one. Uh, but, it, but so then you have the humans and you have the apes. And the interesting thing about the apes was that the parts that were human were the parts that were missing. You know, in the case of Lucy, it was the feet. In the case of uh, Naledi, they had the feet, or, or not Naledi, um, Artipithecus ramidus. You know, and that's funny too. You know, Lucy was named after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yeah. Or LSD. Yeah. You're like, oh, well, now it's all becoming clear. <laughs> <It's> like, but, <laughs> but the angle of the knee joints and the curved hands and the all these things are tree climbing ape features that you see. Of course see they right are. Now. So I don't. But their feet, which were missing, but left the Laetoli tra tracks. Right. You have the Laetoli tracks that are supposedly even older, and they're perfectly and, human. So you know. 
Well, of course, now... L LSD, just think yeah, LSD. Yeah, there we are. You got it. Uh, then we had, uh, then, uh, then we had, uh, and now, now we have the, the tracks from Crete, which are, uh, yeah, the if, tracks from if Crete, they that, know how to date just seals all, the whole which fate may of not everything. be true, but if they do, well, the very, at the very least, the tracks from Crete, you have to know that those tracks were produced before the Mediterranean was filled up with water. Right. And so if it was produced before then, whatever the tracks are in Africa, the tracks in Crete came first. Right. And you're like, okay, well, that messes up the whole out of Africa thing at the very least. And, you know. and, and at the same time messes up the, well, two to three million years ago, we were gradually changing. Right, no, you had perfect humans as far back as you have fossils, basically. Well, actually what you had was apes who had independently evolved to walk on well, uh, two feet. They've got two apes with human feet, right? Uh, anyway, <laughs> LSD. <laughs> so, there's transplants. And you know, yeah, there's such a desire though to, to discover something important that, that people are willing to warp their interpretations of things and, and turn their brains off. Well, see, this is the fun part, is Naledi was found and they didn't have a date and they guessed at it because yeah. it fit. And they come to because find you out. already know what the date is. When you go in already knowing what the answer is, that's what things are going to end up being. Right. So, uh, yeah. And the same thing having to do with having to guess how big the brain was. And the guess was 440 to 5, uh, 560 or whatever. Of course, if you had sent a creationist in to discover that, the brain would have turned out much bigger than 600 cc's probably. Yeah. You know. Uh, and it's, now, uh, this and, goes and now to we bias, have a goes complete one and it's 610. Yeah. Right. So bias plays a part on both sides. Yeah. You know, we have to be careful of our own bias, but then, you know, clearly that yeah. the evolutionary scientists are not without their yeah. special biases. Either. But the, the, the point is, if you read it in the papers, even if you read it in the original report, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, I was just wondering, going back a little bit, uh, has anybody explored the idea that maybe these people didn't have ropes and they were maybe the, the culture that these are outcasts and they were actually just thrown down there and they didn't come back out, but it the only way out was to find, and then they just died in there. And there was, was there any evidence there was ritual that they were buried and somebody carried the pieces in there and then- Well, that's a good question. A monument? But in that case, why you've, you've done quite a bit to, to make, create a prison. And uh, remember the question is not so much that they re regarded the afterlife, although that's an interesting and important question, as is, were they deliberately able to navigate tunnels in, in basically pitch darkness? And end up in the same spot every time. And, yeah. yeah. I and mean, I've gone caving a lot, and if you switch out the lights, good luck finding the same spot, <laughs> you know? I'm bothered by the fact that uh, they took these small women to bring the pieces out. What did they, did they have very small people? How did they get a whole person if the women had to go like this, or was there other entry? Well, you know, that raises a really interesting question because whoever did it would have had to have crawled through and then hook the rope on to the deceased or whatever pull, and pull then pull them through. Well, that's how you do with your backpacks and stuff. When you go caving, you crawl through first and then pull through your backpack well, what do you behind you. The no, they had brains, they had brain size of the 600 cc, so well, these are little people. Okay, these are little people. They're five feet tall total, okay? So asking for small modern women actually would kind of fit. Wait just a minute, we got a... We got a mic for you because we're kind of trying oh, to record you for posterity. No, no, they're they're perfectly they're perfectly good questions, and a lot of people will be asking that, and and so uh, we we do want to catch him, uh, but it is important. Uh, yeah, this was purposeful activity. This is not likely unless there's been the ground has opened and closed again. Um, sort of a la uh, Corridathan and Abiram. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, and then it closed back up. I mean, it's, yeah. Along with the, uh, an owl. Along with an owl. Uh, <laughs> 
a very bad owl. Well, maybe the owl was going <laughs> after the, the, the bones of the people and scattered them around and ate uh, uh, until its heart's content and then couldn't fly and you got out. one ape tooth, right? And yeah. an owl? It almost well, seems... Yeah, but one baboon tooth. So was that a talisman? I, you know, it's a whole bunch of interesting questions. The rats, of course, could get there. Yeah. The rats, I can, the, I can see. The rats could. They run that. around in total darkness, and it's no big deal. And if they climb down a, a chute and then can't get back up, well, whatever. Although it's interesting to ask the question: If, if there were a couple of rats down there, why didn't they eat all of the bones? They died first, I guess. I don't know. I, uh, you, you know, it's, it's. Uh, I don't know if rats like concentrate on bones, though, right? They, well, they eat some of the marrow and stuff, but, but I don't you, think you they think crunch away. But you think they'd like chew, uh, you know, into the marrow or something? Yeah, but they, they would, they wouldn't survive after. Probably, if the rat made it all the way there, they'd eat what they could, and then couldn't get it out, and then they starved to death. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, another question. Uh, just a minute. We're going to catch this one for you. Okay, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I also, they, it occurred to me that to get it in there, maybe they were chopped up first, but there's been no, uh, uh, it, no There's been no marks on the bones that like, That's they got what I chopped. was gonna ask, yeah. yeah, yeah. At least not that we know of. Now, uh -huh. you did notice that on that one hand, there was a piece of the metacarpal missing. Maybe yeah. that's one of the ones that the rat got. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I wish we had a video, although our stomachs would probably turn if we watched it, so I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a good thing we don't. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of interesting questions. What it doesn't look like is, this is just random whatever that got in, because somebody had some purpose in getting human remains down there. Especially if they're children. Yeah. Some of them Especially are. Especially if they're children. Yeah, the children did not crawl through the, the Superman's crawl deliberately and then climb up the rocks and then get over. And the other funny thing of it is that if all you're doing is shoving them through the Superman's crawl, why aren't there bones in the upper chamber? So it suggests that even if they did, they were using this like a prison, then when they got done, somebody grabbed the bodies and dumped them down the chute and then scattered the remains on the floor so that it wouldn't be all in one place. So... May I suggest that there are too many variables that are unknown true. for this, for us to even reasonably hypothesize without going into f total fiction. Yes, but I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I can't help but think in terms of actual science. And the more I hear about this entire mm, field, uh, and it sounds to me more and more hokey. Every time I, I listen to yet another presentation, it, 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 it well, it's fortunately, this is troubling. the last of it's, those. It's troubling because it seems that we're so fond of some ideas that we're looking for anything that we can tack them onto. Yes. And that's a problem. That is not the way to find solutions. Yes. This is why we do double blind studies in order to avoid, uh, how should I say, painting ourselves into some corner or, or going up some dead end creek or whatever you want to, whichever metaphor you want to use. Uh, it's, 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 it, no science would be possible if this is what we're limited to, this kind of approach. If we really need to think every time we do any kind of research, we need to think in terms of what is the control? So now that I have a control, is that control legitimate for this particular sample? Yes, and, we have seen that happen in uh, when people use Europeans 
to compare the hobbit to and don't use Zarampasasa pygmies who live on the same island today. Well, what's wrong with that picture? You know, I, I don't understand the logic of that. Well, you know, this is... One of the things I think we need to come away from this with is the conviction that because you believe that humans can land on the moon does not mean that you must believe in Homo naledi being a human ancestor. That there is science and there is science and some of it's really good and some of it's mm, maybe not so much. Well, I wouldn't doubt that they were ancestors to somebody, but... Maybe not. Maybe not well, or, or maybe... <laughs> maybe or relatives to somebody. Or you know, relatives to somebody or, or maybe they even had children who somehow managed to be somewhere else. Uh, at the time of this burial or, or something, uh, you know, but, but why go into such hypothesis for which we have no data whatsoever? Now, there's something else that I think is probably important in this regard, and that is, think of it, the bones look fresh. <laughs> so, so, so if the bones are fresh, can we not isolate something out of them? Like, like maybe perhaps DNA? protein or DNA or some such thing, and actually uh, find out uh, a little more about this yeah. uh, ancestry business. Yeah. But don't mention carbon-14 dating. I mean, we well, already did, know what that is. They did is, do the DNA with Neanderthals. Wrong. They got Neanderthal DNA, but then they ended up uh, clustering outside of the, the human population, but they did averages. So they did average cluster and then an average cluster for the human population for these mutations, right? But when you look at the whole spectrum of the human population, you, for, find, you, you find that the Neanderthals sort of. are included in the spectrum, right? Right. And so you're, in fact, the human spectrum is, is broader than the ape spectrum. And, yeah. and so you could, be interesting you to could actually rightly call your neighbor yeah. a Neanderthal, Well, what would be right? interesting to do is to, see whether, <laughs> is to see whether these people are related to, say, Bushmen. Yeah, so if I holler out my window, you Neanderthal, it could be true, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, it's more likely for me than an African, although yeah. that may be an artifact because it turns out that when they, when they compare Neanderthals with other humans, they exclude all of the traits that they share with Africans. So the fact of the matter is that Africans may have some Neanderthal in them too, and we just, we've kind of by definition Well, it turns out that the Neanderthal it. brains is actually average on average larger than the modern human brain. And so your neighbor, when you call him a Neanderthal, may say thank you. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> They're also stronger. They're stronger, could run farther, and they have bigger brains. So you're like, oh. Yeah. The D yeah. Uh, don't worry, it's, it's coming. He has to turn it on. Oh. Go ahead, keep going. The DNA testing that all these companies are doing now, they are saying, uh, you know, you have such a, a, a small part of Neanderthal. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, you, you, the 23andMe will tell you you're 2% Neanderthal. Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we are Neanderthal. <laughs> that's right. My son is 4% Neanderthal. You are? My son. Oh. I don't know if it comes from me or his father. Yeah, my father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it's obvious that he comes from you because you're strong and all. No. <laughs> and smarter, yeah. <laughs> oh, brother, That's good. This is turning into a popcorn party. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, Come back next week and we will talk about the flood, new evidence, and come back the week after and we'll talk about the fact that humans go past this, which means that we have that horrible thing where you have to have the ape to human transition before all of this stuff. It's all irrelevant. Anyway, have fun.